But uh, we're going to move back into the book of John, as I mentioned, and uh, it's something I've been looking forward to, and I know a number of you as well. Uh, John has been pretty popular, and a lot of people have been enjoying the sermon series. So, as I said, John 10 in the New Testament. And the, the, the particular chapter we have today has two of the I am statements, two of the I am sayings that Jesus made. And one is, I am the door, and that occurs twice in this passage. And the other one is, I am the good shepherd. And that also occurs twice in this passage. And if you don't know the background of John 10, John 10 is probably built on the shoulders of Ezekiel 34. And if you're not familiar with Ezekiel 34, I would understand that because a lot of us won't remember Ezekiel 34. But it's in that chapter um, where if you're a leader in the church, if you're a pastor, or if, if you're a deacon, a, a trustee, an elder, leading anything in a church, really, um, if, if you're a leader in the church, Ezekiel 34 is one of those passages that would be a useful passage to probably read and remind ourselves of on an almost weekly uh, sort of basis. Because it's one of, those, one of those things in the Old Testament, it's one of those powerful warnings that are given that, that point out the difference between what is a, a true shepherd and what is a, a false shepherd. And, and that reminds us then that in the New Testament, of course, that, that leaders, and in particular pastors, but leaders in the church, um, are called under-shepherds, right? Under-shepherds being under Jesus as the head shepherd, and we're under-shepherds. And so we, we, we come under Jesus there, and, and our responsibility is to, to pastor the flock of God. And so what we have in the beginning of John 10, verses 1 through 6, is, is a parable. And uh, we're familiar with parables. Many of us have heard these parables before. But we see in these first six verses, uh, Jesus gives this parable, and, and his listeners don't really understand what it was that he was saying, which so often was the case when Jesus spoke in parables. And so uh, Jesus makes himself out to be this door, right? And a door into a sheepfold. And, and they're like, what are you talking about, man? And, and, and because they don't understand it, then he goes on to elaborate and explain in verses 7 through 21. And the rest of the chapter beyond that is, is effectively just uh, another one of Jesus' kind of debates and dialogues and confrontations that he's had that we've learned about in the previous portions of John. That he had these conflicts and, and dialogues ongoing with the Jews in Jerusalem of his time. Now this was occurring during the Feast of Dedication, which was a, a winter celebration that they would celebrate in Jerusalem. And it was to remind themselves and to celebrate the Maccabean revolt. And I don't want to get into all the church history stuff there, but a very if you want to read uh, church history stuff, the Maccabean time, the Maccabean revolt is a very, very interesting segment of Israel's history that I would encourage you to uh, read some other time. But it's a, a fascinating set of stories there. But I'm going to read for you John 10, 1 through 21. would invite you to follow along as you see fit. And there we see in the Bible it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls out, or, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and he scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have also other sheep that are not of this fold. And I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay my life, I lay down my life, and I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. 
There was again division among the Jews because of these words, and many of them said, He has a demon, and is he insane? Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now there's going to be kind of a a quick hitter series of seven different things I want you to catch today out of this passage. And I'm going to highlight all of those for you. You can follow along in your sermon notes and see those there. And the very first thing that I want you to catch today uh, that, that Jesus is talking about here is that Jesus says that he knows his sheep. Now in verse 3 he says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. And then in verse 14 he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own they know me. And then again, uh, further on down, all the way into 27, if you read ahead, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Now here Jesus is is contrasting a a true shepherd from what he calls in verse 12 a, a hired hand, right? A hireling. And now, as you're thinking in this story and we're talking about sheep, you have to, to stop thinking about lamb chops. I know you might be already getting hungry for lunch. Quit it. No mutton, no eating, thinking quite yet. I'll get you out of here before it's lunchtime. But you know if you raised sheep. Uh, uh, I grew up in South Dakota and I had a bunch of college friends who, who were sheep farmers because northwestern South Dakota has an unbelievable amount of sheep. If you've never driven through there, and I don't recommend driving through there because there's no reason to drive through there, but if you ever happen to drive through northwestern South Dakota, it's north of where Kevin grew up. I mean, it's just the end of the earth. There are sheep everywhere. I mean, the first time I drove out there, uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard that there was sheep. But I'm driving, and it's just like the fields were fluffy, and it was July. And I'm like, it's like all white everywhere. And I'm like, holy cow, they weren't kidding about how many sheep are out in this area. It was, it was amazing. But, but, but you learn, uh, you know, as you, you, you raise sheep, if you raise sheep at that scale and those kind of sheep anyhow, you don't do the bonding thing with your sheep, right? Some of you had the rule growing up, a lot of you grew up around or on farms, that you don't name the animals that you're going to eat, right? That, that, that's just a good rule of thumb. And, and in the ancient Near East, though, the sheep were raised mostly for their wool rather than for their meat. Uh, because the wool is a renewable resource. As you shear them every year, they grow it back. And the wool can be very valuable, especially in those days where textiles were hard to come by. I mean, the, the, it, it was hard to get materials. We didn't have synthetics and those kind of things. So, so wool was a big deal. Wool, wool, of course, is fabulous in its insulative value. If it gets wet, uh, it gets super heavy. But, but it still, still does a good job of keeping you nice and warm and protecting you. Um, you don't, you don't want to get it wet because it like triples in weight. And, you know, I always wondered, I wondered why sailors' wives used to make their sweaters out of wool, because if that thing got wet, they were never going to swim in it, right? I, I wasn't sure what that meant from, from a perspective of husbands and wives, but whatever. Um, but, but they would raise these sheep uh, to, to have the wool, right? And because of that, they would get to know their sheep. They, they would begin to bond with their sheep. And a true shepherd at this time would know his sheep. Now, years ago, um, I I worked with a guy. I was a backpacking guide for a number of years in New Mexico, and and it was for the Boy Scouts. And so I had people come from all over the country. And I had a a group come from um, Arlington, Virginia, I think is where they were, from just outside of Washington, D.C. And and one of their leaders was a a very interesting guy. I I, I got to talking with him one afternoon, finding out he is uh, the directory of uh, a portion of the Department of Treasury. And, and, And the portion that he directed, uh, oversees all of the anti-counterfeit, you know, kind of things that go on in the world. Uh, so part of his job was making sure the, 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 our, our money, if you don't know, our money is made out of a cloth. It's not actually made out of paper. And so part of his job was to make sure that, that cloth was properly made and sourced. Uh, and then he would go to the different mints and make sure that their processes were in order. But, but he said, most of what I do is, is anti-counterfeiting. And so uh, he had spent years and years and years learning about the, the currency that we have and learning how to detect, uh, you know, false currency, counterfeit currency, and, and uh, he, he was so good, he could just, he could in an instant tell you on the spot whether a bill you had was or, or wasn't a fake. 
And so he, he pulled out, he proceeded to pull out a $20 bill out of his wallet. And he, he, he's one of those kind of guys. He had a magnifying glass with him. And uh, he pulls out this $20 bill and this magnifying glass. And he just starts showing me. We're sitting around a campfire in the middle of the woods in, in the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico. And, and he's sitting there just geeking out over a dollar bill, right? And, but but he's, he shows me like in, in a matter of seconds, like 50 different things on this $20 bill that I had never seen before. Right? I mean, I've, I've seen like the little tiny writings and some of those things, but he's like pulling stuff out. And I'm just like, this guy's a savant. It's, it's amazing how much he knows about our currency. And he's just bam, bam, bam. He's showing me, I see this and I look at this and I, you know, and then he started talking about his rates and he said, I'm at about 99% within 10 seconds. I can tell you 99% accuracy, whether a bill is counterfeit or not. And, and I'm like, holy smokes, this guy's is, is good, really good at what he does. In fact, he says, yeah, you know, I kind of compliment him. And he said, yeah, he said, I'm actually known as the best in the world for anti-counterfeiting of the American currency. And I was like, holy smokes, this guy's got a, an important job, right? And, 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 and he's put all this time in to, to learn it and to get to know it at a deeper level than anybody else possibly could know it. Now, the very same thing happens to us when we're talking about Jesus. In the very same way, Jesus knows his sheep. He knows us by name. He knows us at an intimate level because he's put the time in with us. Jesus is always there, always with us, ever present at all times. And he knows us better than we frankly even know ourselves. And it's because he's invested the time in us. You might remember how as Jesus spoke to Nathaniel, right? He says, as Nathaniel comes to him, he says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And you remember what Jesus, or what Nathaniel said back to, to Jesus at that time? Nathaniel's like, how do you know me? Right? He's like, I've never met you before. How do you know me, brother? He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't, he's like, who, what? How do you know me? Or how about when Jesus is walking down the street one day, right? He looks up in a tree. Who was up in the tree? Any kids still in the room? Zacchaeus, right? Now, as far as we know, Jesus had never had an encounter with Zacchaeus. It wasn't like they were hanging out at the watering hole the other day and, and then he sees Zacchaeus up in the tree. No, Jesus is walking down a random street, some guy up in a tree. What does Jesus do? He knows his name, points him out. He says, hey, buddy, Zacchaeus, you, I know you. Get out of that tree, right? He knows his name. He calls him by name. You see, Jesus never forgets your name. He knows who you are. In fact, as I said, he knows you better than you know yourself. Remember, Paul, Paul is, is saying that um, one of the things he's talking about as, in the book of Thessalonians is how we are uh, to come as under shepherds, as elders, as leaders of the church. And, and Paul talks about that. And Paul says, one of the things that Paul does in modeling that is he says, I remember all of you in prayer. Right? Um, one of the things Paul did is, is lead and guide by modeling. And he went to different places and, and taught and all these things. But he also had to model some of these behaviors from afar. And so as he would write letters back to these churches, he'd, he'd do things like, like, he'd write a letter and say, you know, we always thank God for, for, for you for making mention of you in our prayers. We, we pray for you regularly. Uh, and so Paul would do things like, he would keep lists probably somehow. He had scribes with him or whatever. I'm not sure how he did it, but, but he would keep lists of the, the people he would pray for. He would, he'd write it down. Or, or what I do is uh, you know, I, I, I use a prayer journal and I have a, a book where I write my prayers in and I'll write people's names in that I'm praying for. And I can go back years later and I can see those prayers because if I don't write it down, frankly, I'll forget that I was praying for it. And so it's important for me, at least, as a process to write it down. So I write those things down. But, but here's the thing. Jesus does that automatically and he does that naturally and he doesn't forget and he does it perfectly because he knows you and, and his list doesn't have to be written because he knows you intimately because he created you. So he can go to that next level far above and beyond anything that we can do. Uh, that's the way that, that Jesus knows us. Now as we read this passage, notice that this is a reciprocal relationship. Look at what he says in verse 14. Jesus says, I know them, and they know me, right? And it is 
based, as you see here, that it's based on this relationship between the Father and the Son, and the Son knowing the Father and the Father knowing the Son, right? That's, that's how we are to know Jesus and Jesus is to know me. We have this similar, likewise, relationship. And, and, and not only that, it's even more wonderful than that. If you were to jump even further down the part I didn't read, if you get all the way down to verse 38, you, you can see one of those verses that almost begs that we go deeper into it, but I'm not gonna because I don't want to be here until 2 o'clock, so I'll limit myself. But, but at the end of verse 32, Jesus says, understand that the, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. The first person is in the second person. The second person is in the first person. As you read that, your mind kind of almost begins to swim, right? But what it is saying is that, that every action of the Father is in some way linked to the Son, and every action of the Son is in some way linked to the Father, so that they never act independent of each other. And that is partly what it means when Jesus says, I know you. It means that he and his sheep are in union together in a bond of covenantal fellowship. I know you, he says. I've committed to you. And when Jesus says he knows us, he knows us in the midst of all of our mess and all of our stink, right? Back to the sheep for just a second. I don't know if you've hung out with sheep. They're a funky animal, especially as that wool starts to grow, right? Because it's not like, you know, I, I've got a puppy, and my puppy keeps himself fairly clean. His, you know, he likes to lick himself and keep him clean. Not sheep, right? They got this wool with the lanolin. You, you know what lanolin is. It's stuff that kind of makes your hands super soft, right? Um, it's, it's a very nice oil, and uh, that, that wool is filled with it. But that wool is filled with all sorts of other funk. That, that's not always the pleasant smelling funk either. So sheep get a little smelly, right? And Jesus says, I know you even when you smell like sheep. I know you even when you got that stink on you. I know you, and I choose to know you. And I know you deeply, and I know you intimately. I know you better than you know you. That's the commitment, that's the level that Jesus has for us. And he wants that to be a reciprocal re relationship. Now, we can't know Jesus to that same degree, but we can choose to know him more and more and more. Now, the second thing I want you to see here about what Jesus is saying is that he says, not only does he know his sheep, but he leads his sheep, right? Look at verses 3 and 4. To him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And then later on in verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, in this culture and in this time and in this place, the good shepherd leads his sheep, guides his sheep. We know from the Psalms, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures beside still waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness. He leads me. He guides me, Right? And just as he knows our name, the sheep know his voice and they follow him wherever he leads. And you see, he never leads us to bad places. Jesus never leads us to sin. And if he does ask you to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? That's part of that other passage out of that psalm. If he asks us to walk through trouble or trial, He'll never ask you to do that without Him already having gone there first. When, when Jesus leads us, His leading is not in the sense of the pace car, the Daytona 500, but it's rather in the sense of, of the lead locomotive on the train, right? The pace car just drives out in front of all the other cars. What's the locomotive do? It blazes the way, pulling everything along behind it. That's how Jesus leads. And the whole point is that, that we are not being led by our own strength, but we are being led by a strength and a power given to us by the Holy Spirit through Jesus. And that, that Jesus is saying that here, and that, that, that He leads us because He's united to us. Because there is a bond, because there is a, a relationship. We were singing some songs the other night that uh, the sing inspiration, and many of you know William Williams as him where he says, guide me, O oh, thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art my, mighty. 
hold me with thy powerful hand, right? Well, there's another one by J.H. Gilmore. It says, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words of heavenly comfort fraught, wherever, whatever I, I can't speak it tonight, <laughs> today, whatever I do, wherever I be, still till God's hand, He leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me. By His own hand, He leadeth me. His faithful follower, I would be. For by His hand, He leadeth me. Those two men have captured that idea so, so well. Now, not only does Jesus lead you, but then He feeds you. Jesus feeds His sheep. Verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You see, the great concern in the, in the Near East is, is to find pasture, to find grass, to find things to eat for your sheep, right? If you've got a whole flock of sheep and you live in an arid desert land, finding lots of green things for them to stay healthy on is sometimes a challenge. And Jesus, he feeds us. He feeds us with spiritual food. He feeds us with His Word. He instructs us. He gives us a a, a healthy diet. He he nourishes us and tries to build us up in His Word, right? Remember what, what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, 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 do you love me? Yeah, yeah, Lord, of course I do, right? Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Right? Jesus is concerned that his sheep get fed. That's why it's so important that uh, leaders and pastors of churches are concerned that the people of the church are not just fed the, the equivalent of spiritual junk food, right? And Jesus is saying, I'm concerned about my sheep, that they are fed and that they are nourished. That's why the the, the writer of Hebrews urged his readers to eat solid food, right? And and, and he says, it's it's time to move on from kind of the milk and the mush. Get to the meat and potatoes, says the writer of Hebrews. And so so God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, feed us through his word. Given us the Bible, 66 books, over 2 million words that we can put into ourselves. So that we can be complete in our relationship with him. The next thing I want you to see is that Jesus also saves his sheep. Again, Jesus reiterates this on a couple of occasions in this passage. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is, of course, before Jesus went to the cross. Then he says again in verse 15, Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. And then he repeats it again in 17 and 18. It says, He lays his life down for the sheep. And there's two parts to to what Jesus is saying here. And in the first place, if you jump all the way down to verse 29, he says, my father who has given them to me, before he lays his life down for them, Jesus has received his sheep, his people, in covenant from the father. See, God covenanted with his people. He said, I am your God and you will be my people. And Jesus is in on this very same covenant. Jesus is a recipient of this. Jesus is fully part of that. And what Jesus does in his earthly ministry and up on the cross has its beginnings from before time. All the way back. Starting with the covenant between Father God and Father Son. That relationship of the Trinity. And then that relationship between Father, God, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect unity, in perfect relationship in heaven, extends that relationship down through us, down into time, into the Old Testament times, and makes a covenant and says Abraham, and makes a covenant and says Moses, and makes a covenant and, and, and connects and relates and creates Israel and brings all of this together and is faithful to keep all of that going for thousands and thousands of years, and then again comes through Jesus in the New Testament and, and connects with us in a deeper, richer, more personal covenant, because then Jesus himself comes down and then he lays down his life for his sheep. He, he, he purchases the sheep salvation with his own life and blood. 
And, and in this idea, in this language that he's speaking about of, uh, of laying it down and laying, it's a laying aside is probably a better way of putting it, is, is much in the same way like, like when we come in from our houses here in the middle of winter in, in Minnesota, right? We, we, we take off of our, our, our outer garments, our cloaks, our clothes, right? Because we're, we're, we're wrapped up to, you know, it's like 20 below the other day and I, I couldn't put enough layers on, right? But when I come in the house, and, and this is the worst, I feel bad for my puppy because like, like, He's got a piddle and he's doing the puppy dance, right? And he's standing there by the door, let me out, let me out. I'm like, it's 20 below. I got to put layers on, dog. I'm not wearing a fur coat. So I'm like grabbing everything and trying to get the hat on and everything, getting outside, right? And then when I come back inside, it's like, I got to peel all this junk off and hang it back up and put it away so it's not in the way, and, right? And, and, and that's kind of this idea that, that we're seeing here in this passage that, that, that we'll see later on again here in John 13 in a few weeks, that as Jesus lays this aside, as he lays it down, as he puts it to the side, it says, similar to when he, he lays aside his garments, when he comes before his disciples and he gets down on his knees, and the Bible tells us that he laid aside his garments and, 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 and he washed their feet. This laying it aside, this putting it to the side, this modeling of setting everything aside for the other that, that Jesus is showing us, that, that he is shedding his blood on behalf of the sheep to redeem them, to purchase them, because he calls us mine. He looks at you and he says, you're mine. You are mine. You're mine. That's what Jesus does. John Murray says it this way. He says, death was not his fate. It was his deed. He grasped it. Death was his triumphal act. Never was Jesus more victorious than he was on the cross. Now, in the background here, as I said, is this Ezekiel 34 thing going on, where it speaks of these false shepherds who, who frankly, only were going to take care of themselves, right? It takes a great deal for, for a shepherd to purchase the sheep and to call them mine. The cost, the sacrifice, to lay your life down for some stinky, stupid animal. Now, I'm sorry, the Bible calls us stinky, stupid animals, but it kind of does, right? Don't go home and tell everybody that your pastor called you a stinky, stupid animal. That's not what I'm saying. But that's kind of what Jesus did. He looked at us and said, what a train wreck. What a mess. Wow, I love him. Wow, I love her. I'm going to lay my life down for that mess. That's what Jesus does. He calls us his own. Not only does he do that, but this passage tells us that Jesus guards his sheep as well. In verses 12 and 13, Jesus points out how the, the hired hand flees when the wolf comes, right? But not so the shepherd. The shepherd stays and fights and protects. When you know and when you love the sheep, you're not going to go down without a fight. You don't abandon them. You, you, don't, you don't let them go wandering off. You fight for them. And you try to keep them safe. And Jesus does that very thing for you and for me. One of the primary ways that he does this is through a local church like this, where, where we take teaching the Bible seriously. We try to be careful with, with who teaches and what they teach. There's a, there's a lot of things out there, right, that, that aren't the best. There's a lot of books out there, a lot of speakers, a lot of teachers, a lot of preachers, a lot of stuff out there that, frankly, calls itself Christian, but I would not recommend it to you. There's a bunch of mess out there. People trying to basically make a buck. And sadly, you'll find a lot of those people on television, right? And, and you'll see a lot of them with big book contracts. So, so it's popular. Popular does not equal good. Let's be clear about that. And this was a problem back in Jesus' time too. It's not new today. People who are more concerned about the financial side of the business, enriching themselves more concerned about that than they were about handling God's word properly. And one of the dangers of not being connected to a good Bible-believing and Bible-preaching and teaching church is that on our own, theologically, we can quickly, quickly, quickly get off track. If we're not connected, if we're not grounded in a body of believers, 
Our theology can go wayward very fast. There's all sorts of resources out there to speed along that descent. So to guard his sheep, Jesus gave us the church. The body of believers for us to be plugged into so that we can be accountable towards them. Because Jesus knew on our own, left to our own devices, we were going to go astray. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Right? Oh, to grace how great a debtor. I will wander, 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 wander without Jesus. He knew we would go astray. So he guards us and he provides for us and he protects us. Not only does he do that though, but he also seeks his sheep. Look at verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them also, he says. This is a great missionary text, frankly. Jesus didn't come for just a few believers living in the city of Jerusalem and then maybe Antioch, right? Jesus came for the believers who were, who were in, in, in Athens and people in Rome and people in Cairo and people in Baghdad and people even over in Green Bay. Yes, Jesus came for the people in Green Bay even. And Jesus is saying, I have, I have Christians in this country and that country and in every country. I have Christians in that people group and I must, I must seek them and bring them in also. And we we got to learn and have this heart that Jesus has here. Jesus wants every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And that includes even those people we don't particularly like, right? That includes the people who don't look like us, act like us, think like us, talk like us, eat like us. Jesus wants to be in relationship with everyone. And that can be hard for us at times, right? Because sometimes we're stubborn like Jonah, right? Remember the story of Jonah? We want our church. We want our life. We, we want it the way we want it, but we don't want those sinful Ninevites in that club, right? We don't, we don't want, ah, they're a mess. They stink. They smell like sheep. We don't want them here. We don't want them part of that, no. We don't want those people because they make us uncomfortable or, or they're going to make it hard for us or... Sometimes we just don't like them, like Jonah, right? But that's not how Jesus approaches it. He longs to gather in all of his sheep, not just a few. Not just the ones we think he should focus on. All of them, everyone, is who our target should be as well. We have to learn to love like Jesus loved. Learn to serve as Jesus served. Learn to pray for our enemies. That's the standard that Jesus set. Notice another thing that that Jesus says in several places. He says, I am the door of the sheep, in verse 7, right? And the idea of the door is that it is through Jesus that we can enter into salvation. Look how he puts it in verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. We need to be abundantly clear that salvation is only through Jesus. He alone is the door. I know that's not always a popular thing because it's exclusive, but that is what Jesus says. He says it again in verses 27 through 29. He says that he is the door exclusively. That there is no other way of salvation but by faith alone through Jesus Christ alone. That there is no one else, no other, no one good enough, no one else even willing to pay for the price of our sin. There's no one else who looks and goes, man, those sheep are a mess, but I'm going to die for them anyhow. What other God does that? There isn't. Not a one. He is the one and he is the only. There is no one else, there is no other. Only Jesus can unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. And the Father and the Son are involved in this very same mission. That's why he says in verse 30, I and my Father are one. And he means that as a statement of unity in the, in the Trinity in all things, that in purpose, in mission, in goals, they are fully united. And this is a stumbling block for many in the world. 
the exclusivity of Jesus, our world likes pluralism. Our world likes duality and, and options, right? Our world does not like exclusivity, and it does not like the exclusivity of Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't give us the option of there being a plan B, or a plan C, or a plan D. He's clear that it's only through Him. And to reject that is to reject Him. I heard this story a while back. You may have heard this before, but it's a story worth repeating, and I'm going to close with this story. There was a, a wealthy man who loved to collect artwork. He had all kinds of rare art. He had Picasso and Van Gogh and Raphael. And he and his family, particularly his one son, loved to sit down and look at these wonderful paintings they had throughout his home, right? Well, then one day his son was called into active duty in the Vietnam War. And in an act of just outstanding courage, this young man, his son, rescued another Marine. But while doing so, he got shot right in the heart and died immediately. Roughly a month later, near Christmas, there came a knock at the door of this father's house. Father opened it and finds a man there standing dressed in full military uniform. And the young man on his front step says, Sir, you don't know me, but I am the Marine who your son gave his life for. And that day your son saved many lives, in fact. In the process of literally carrying me to safety, he took a bullet to his own heart, and he died. He said, your son often talked about you and shared stories about you and how you guys loved art. And then all the while, this, this soldier is standing there holding this package. And at this point, he kind of extends it out to the father, this package that he's holding, and he says... I want you to have this. The father begins to open it, and inside of this package the soldier had been standing there on his porch holding is, is a painting that the soldier had done, a painting of his son. And the soldier says, well, it's not much. I'm not very good at art, but it's all I could do as a, a token of my gratitude for you and your son. And the father just opens it, and he's just, you know, tears and just... He's like, you, you, you've caught my son. I, I can see his personality in his eyes. And, and you, you've, you've, just, you've done a wonderful job. And he's just, just blessed and astonished and amazed at this gift that he received. So his father goes and he takes down one of these million dollar paintings and, uh, above his fireplace. And he hangs this picture of his son above it. And every time that he has visitors over from that point on, he, 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 rather than showing him a, a Picasso or a Raphael, he, he shows his guests this painting that the soldier did of his son. Now, uh, a few years later, this man passed away. And all of his paintings ended up going to auction because there was no heir. And so they, they were taking them to auction. And there's an auctioneer, and the auctioneer is at the front of the room, and he's pounding a gavel. And he says, all right, quiet, we're going to get started. And there's many people in attendance that day because this guy had a, quite a a set of art that was going up for sale. And the auctioneer says, we're going to start with this painting. And they reveal it. It's this painting of the sun. And he's waiting for a bid, and there's no bids. He's like, who wants to bid? Nobody bids. Pretty soon at the back of the room, somebody says, we want to see the famous paintings. We didn't come here for this. Where's Rembrandt? Picasso? Raphael, Van Gogh, we want those. The auctioneer continues on. He says, no, we're auctioning the sun. Who will take the sun? Who wants the sun? Somebody take the sun. Quietly from back of the room, number goes up. and says, I'll take the sun, $10. 20? 20, 20, 20, going once, going twice, going three times, 20. Any final bids? $10, sir, sold. Bangs the gavel, and the guy walks off the stage. All these art buyers come over. What's going on? What are you doing? We've got all these other paintings we're auctioning off today. That guy bid ten dollars for that one, but we're ready here. We we brought millions. We want to buy some art today. What are you doing? The auctioneer says, "The auction's over. 
I wasn't allowed to tell you this before, but whoever bought that painting got all the rest. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. Whoever takes me gets eternal life and no one can snatch them out of my hand. And there's coming a day, friends, when Jesus is going to present his sheep to his Father and he's going to look and say, look at what I've got. These aren't sheep anymore. They're perfect in God's eyes because we're covered by the blood of Christ. And God sees us then as forgiven and perfect. That's what Jesus offers to you and to me. That's what Jesus wants for us. And if you don't have that, I would invite you to have that today. Let's pray together.